Hello and welcome to this Red Gaming Tech video of myself and Marta. I'm here as always with the latest from the tech world and the last 24 or so hours. So we're going to kick things off today with something from Intel and Ice Lake. Now I do find the timing of this one rather interesting as of course just yesterday Paul discussed the rumours that Intel had cancelled the 10nm process. Now of course Intel were quick to deny this but still timing is interesting. But basically what's happened now is that some keen-eyed observers of the Geekbench database submissions have spotted a submission of a dual-core Ice Lake processor engineering sample, and they also noticed something rather curious. And what is that, I hear you ask? Well, they have increased the sizes of the L1 and L2 cache. The L1 data cache has grown from 32 kilobytes to 48, compared to Coffee Lake and the L2 cache has doubled in size to 512 from the original 256. Now I'm very keen to point out here as well that the L1 instruction cache is still 32 KB in size and the L3 cache is 4 megabytes. Now it is also important to note that the Ice Lake chip we have been looking at here is still a mainstream version of this particular microarchitecture. It's not an enterprise or anything like that. But it is still interesting that we do have this spotted. Does this mean that Intel right that we aren't seeing a cancellation of 10nm? Possibly? Or it could just be that this is just now being spotted. It's really hard to say, but the timing does make me go, hmm, I see. Anyway, let's move on to something a bit different from Supermicro. Now you may recall way back in the dawn of time I actually covered the initial response to this from Supermicro. As you may recall that there was a Bloomberg article which basically said or alleged that Supermicro motherboards have been distributed to people such as Apple, Amazon and so on and so forth with tiny chips tacked on to the circuitry itself and apparently according to again the Bloomberg article these chips which were illegally put on the motherboards themselves allowed complete access to bug machines through nefarious code and apparently this could have exposed all sorts of sensitive information. Now obviously as I discussed myself at the time Supermicro were obviously very keen to deny this and Apple and Amazon have basically backed them up saying look we've seen no evidence of this. But despite Supermicro's quick denial and the helping hand from both Apple and Amazon, we did see Supermicro stock basically go into the toilet. Now we actually have a bit of a statement here from the CEO, CCO and CPO of Supermicro. There's going to be a link to this full letter in the description below this video if you want to give it a read. However, it says, quote, we are confident that a recent article alleging a malicious hardware chip was implemented during the manufacturing process of the motherboards is wrong. From everything we know and have seen, no malicious hardware chip has been implanted during the manufacturing of our motherboards. We trust you appreciate the difficulty of proving that something did not happen, even though the reporters have produced no effective motherboard or any such malicious hardware chip. As we have said firmly, no one has shown us a motherboard containing any unauthorised hardware chip. We are not aware of any such unauthorised chip and no government agency has alerted us to the existence of any unauthorised chip. And they also go on to say that this would also be really, really hard to do. In fact, they say it would be quote unquote virtually impossible for anyone to implant a device capable of communicating with the baseboard management controller. <clears throat> and this is basically just the fact that the base design of the motherboards is a trade secret that apparently no employee has unfettered access to. So it would be really difficult for even its own employees to you know, manipulate hardware, software and firmware to actually bypass the security. As I've already said, both Apple and Amazon have kind of been in Supermicro's corner here saying, look, we've seen no evidence of this. And the Apple CEO has also called for the Bloomberg article to actually be retracted. However, Bloomberg has reiterated its support. But we do see sources cited within the report now are now doubting things. And obviously, again, Supermicro are very keen to be like, look, look, look. Bloomberg are saying X, but no proof of X has actually been provided in terms of like a physical chip or a, or a motherboard that was affected or something of that nature. Now, we should definitely wait and see what actually happens here because if Bloomberg's report is actually true, and obviously Bloomberg are known and respected for its integrity and, you know, journalism and all that sort of stuff. So we should definitely shouldn't throw what they're saying out, but it is an allegation is also important to remember. But if their report is actually true, it is 
definitely eyebrow raising to say the least because while the global implications would be rather huge especially as of course both Apple and Amazon are kind of throwing in saying look you know this article needs to be taken down and so on and so forth so I fully expect this to not be the last of this to be quite frank with you but uh, that is all on that particular topic for now at least. Our next topic is actually regarding the Qualcomm Snapdragon 675. And this was actually announced by Qualcomm today, and it is a mid-range smartphone SoC, but it does have some very interesting high-end features. It is a new Cairo, or Cryo, should I say, 460 architecture, and it is going to be built around the ARM Cortex-A76 cores, which are actually designed for flagship devices that aren't even out on the market yet. What we also see here is two cores at 2 gigahertz alongside six 1.78 gigahertz cores which are designed for power efficiency so we've got two performance cores and then two power efficiency cores just to put that in some sort of context the 845 the obviously the snapdragon 845 uses four 2.8 gigahertz cores based on the cortex 875 however the 845 is built on 10 nm but the 675 is going to be built on 11 nm however Despite the fact of the cores, it is designed for, again, those high-end features that are not yet actually out on the market because we also see a new image signal processor which is actually built with triple camera setups in mind. And we also have Quick Charge 4 Plus support and a faster AI engine as well. So it is a bit odd for Qualcomm to do this because they're kind of mid-cycle, you know, their current Snapdragon is not exactly old. And again, we're not really seeing triple camera setups be the norm, but I think what we're going to be seeing is, well, by maybe next, you know, maybe mid quarter next year, we could see the, the three camera phones come out onto the market and all that sort of stuff. So they're kind of sort of pitching for the future here is, is what I do take away from this particular announcement. So we're actually going to finish things up today with some comments from CCP, who you probably both know better as the developers of EVE Online. Now, as you may or may not recall, on the launch of the Rift and the Vive, we saw a game in the form of EVE Valkyrie, which was developed with VR systems in mind. And what we actually have here is some really interesting comments from the CCP CEO, Hilmar Peterson, who spoke to Destructoid about how he expected, or the company expected, should I say, for VR to become bigger, faster than it currently has. And the rates being well below the marketed attach rates, attachment rate, or should I say, and sales of actual VR headsets. And here's what he actually had to say. He said, quote, we expected VR to be two to three times as big as it was, period. You can't build a business on that. If it does take off, and I mean if, we'll reassess. The important thing is we need to see metrics for active users of VR. A lot of people bought headsets just to try it out. How many of those people are active? We found that in terms of our data, a lot of users weren't. May of last year is when we started to figure it out. Was it a surprise? Maybe. But the picture was filling in that we're there would not be a way to continue with VR as heavily as we were. No regrets, it was right to stop and it was right to start. I remain a long time believer of VR. And I will say he is kind of correct. You know, VR is it's, it's kind of tracking along in the background, it's doing its thing, but he's yet to really set the world alight. And I think, to be honest, it's just down to a few factors. Obviously, as with anything, it's, it's a complex topic, but I'd say the main th sort of three is what the, what the main, main one is obviously the cost even even the psvr which is obviously cheapest out of the options you still have to have a ps4 and a psvr and arguably a ps move as well so you're still looking at a lot of cash there even if you've already got a ps4 it's still not exactly five pence but obviously when you're talking pc vr the cost starts to get extremely high because obviously not only is the vive or the rift or whatever expensive you then have to have a really, really good rig to get a comfortable frame rate. And obviously, if you don't want to be vomiting literally everywhere, you can't need a comfortable frame rate. But it's not even just that. It's the fact that there's not really any killer apps to make you want to spend that amount of cash. Like, yeah, there's a few games. Like there's Eve, for example, and obviously there's Resident Evil 7 and other things like that. And obviously there's unofficial mods for games. I don't actually have support for VR, but you know people have kind of modded it. And but it's a little bit janky and probably makes you feel vaguely ill. But the point is, there's not really any apps or games, should I say, that make you go, oh my god, I need to get a VR headset, because a lot of the time that game is also available on a non-VR format. 
and VR is still in its infancy and I do still believe that it has the opportunity the chance to be like the next sort of big innovation as it were for the gaming industry that the sort of next step forward in immersion because obviously we can continue to go forward with photorealistic graphics and all sort of stuff but at some point we are going to reach the limits especially on our current technology budgets and so on so VR seems like a sensible step to be like hey look now you're in the game kind of thing so I do want to see it do well but I do feel it needs to address costs accessibility you know the fact that you have to have quite a large space for it to work is obviously quite limiting as well and obviously the amount of games that actually support it is there's you know there's, there's quite a few but there's not enough i would argue especially given the tool asking price to actually even enter the arena that's my personal opinion of course and again i do want to see vr do well and obviously ccp have kind of backed off from it now and i can't really blame them because obviously eve valkyrie has not really set the world on light vr has not set the world on light and they're just kind of waiting to see what actually happens. I think, to be honest, it's going to be the next iterations of the Vive of, or whatever, whatever VR headsets come out in the future that are cheaper, more affordable, more accessible, that is going to maybe start to see it trickle down to sort of mass acceptance, as it were. Anyway, that is me done for this video. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.